<laughs> Welcome to the Better at Beach Volleyball podcast. Today, we are going to be talking about every dumb, uh, misconceived, misunderstood, made up rule and all of the versions of all of these made up rules. And we're going to tell you what the, what the real rules are, uh, according to FIVB and AVC. So if you guys are hoping to dispel some myths, if you constantly get involved in these discussions and arguments over what rules are right, this is going to be your absolute resource. Anytime you get into one of these, you just say, hey, tournament director, check this out. Of course, you would have to stop the tournament, tell the referee that you're going to go over and you're going to get the tournament director so you can get a rule clarification, and then you're going to get to business. So a lot of people, when they're talking about rules, they argue, and it just becomes just a battle of attrition. If you know the rules, you can display them or you can tell them to that referee. And then if they don't know the rules or they're trying to say something else, they need to give you a, a reasonable explanation. And everybody is an amateur referee, but it's totally okay to stop a tournament and say, hey, let me just check with your boss. It's basically like going into McDonald's and say, well, let, let, let me speak to your manager, right? Because that's the person who knows the real rules and you can get stuff done. So if you ever get into a real argument and you know that you're right, it's always okay to stop and say, let me just talk to the tournament director for a little bit. That's what we're going to be talking about today, how to argue the right rules, what the right, what the right rules are, most commonly discussed ones. And uh, my name is Mark Burke, and as always, co-host Brandon Joyner. What's going on, baby? Hello. Uh, it's good to be back. Another Monday. Um, we just got a couple of announcements. Um, we, uh, we just got back from doing one of our awesome day clinics in San Francisco and I'm still on a high from it. It was, it was just amazing. It, the crew up there is something else, you know, it was just, it was one of those, it, when we do our camps, our camps are cool because obviously by the end of a week, you, you feel like, you know, every single person, uh, but it does take a few days. And for some reason with this San Francisco crew, uh, the second we started talking to everybody as a group, it already felt like we were towards the end of that week and we were a part of their family. They were a part of ours. And it, it, it in my opinion, as, as far as a day clinic goes, it could not have gone better. I, I think our, our coaches we had, we had Joe Kramer with us, uh, Ali Denny, DJ, uh, Col I don't want to say it wrong. Klesnik. George Klesnik. And he's definitely going to listen to this episode and give me a hard time for that. But <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, it's just, it's awesome. We, you sent a text out to, to us yesterday uh, explaining how grateful we are as, as, as us to have this great family around us and, it, it truly is awesome and it, and it feels really, I feel so fortunate to be working with a good crew of people. Um, it's, just, it's just fun. And this weekend just added to it. It was great. Yeah. It, you know, good people too. I think when we started mm -hmm. seven years ago, just wild to say, uh, the San Fran crew was, they were great to us. You know, we, we had two big kind of loyal followings or people who came down to Hermosa. One of them was uh, the people from Vancouver. A huge group came from Vancouver, and then the last two years haven't seen much of them just because of all travel restrictions and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't want to uh, come play volleyball for a week and then spend 14 days alone in a hotel room <laughs> due to it. It's called commitment. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and then uh, the crew from San Francisco, who uh, has just been like great to us, good people, just keep meeting friends. Mm -hmm. It's so much fun just to find friends out of this you know people who you didn't you, you didn't know were in the world but as soon as you meet them it's like man if we had been born within the same mile we would have been best friends for yeah. sure but now we just you know get to scatter them around the globe which is always special i think yeah and it's, it's cool i we had a mission 
I, I think it's been your mission the whole time and it's a, it's been a mission since we started better at beach, but get 1 million people better at beach volleyball. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're probably pretty close to that, but I I've kind of realized that it's so much more than that now. It's, it's the community aspect, the mm -hmm. welcoming people to the sport and family of beach volleyball is, is what we're doing. And it, it definitely feels, it feels like that. And it's, it's so rewarding. So, uh, if you're interested in us coming to your area, if you want us to come run a clinic in your spot, I know we have a couple coming up. We're in Salt Lake city next month. Uh, we're in Ozark after that. We're mm -hmm. <clears throat> possibly going up to New York, yep. um, Alabama. And so it's starting Grand to grow. Sands, Ohio, with John Ohio. Drake. Yep. With sorry. Lewis. How'd I forget about that? Yeah. Um, and uh, so if you want us to come to your area, we'd love to add you to our friend list and, and our family. So definitely get in touch with us. Definitely. Um, and we've got a couple new designs up uh, on on our shirt store that we put up last week. So if you, if you guys are looking for some fun volleyball shirts, we got a cool new, uh, some cool new designs. One of them that uh, I don't know if I made famous, but I definitely made fun. <laughs> It's the over you call anytime you're spiking, hitting over somebody. It's probably the most disrespectful thing you can do in beach volleyball, which <laughs> I, I absolutely love. Other than like an underhand sort of directly to somebody. Um, right. And I will say it in the midst of getting blocked. <laughs> and I have. And uh, it's, a, it's a good call, but we made a, a fun graphic out of it. So if you guys want to check out some of our apparel or any of the shirts that like, we're currently wearing, you guys can buy that uh, betterbeach.com forward slash shop and you can check on the click on the apparel section there and it'll bring you to our whole list of, uh, of swag. But that's a, that's a little pre-commercial. We usually wait to the middle. Yeah, so we did it. Uh, let's talk dumb rules. Yeah. Um, I, I think we start off right away with uh, one of the one of the rules that I, I truly do think is slowing down the prog progression in a lot of areas. And that has to do with the double hand contact on setting. Um, I, I think one of the biggest dumb rules that I've heard at any tournament that I've ever played in was, oh, that ball, like it, I'll see someone get called for a double, they'll ask why, and then the referee will say something about, oh, it spun more than two rotations. <laughs> that is one of the, the, if I hear that, you're just opening yourself up for me to try to make you sound dumb. Um, it's, it's something that it, we've, and, it, and it's hard because as the levels get lower, they tend to use that idea of that rule harder. Oh yeah. You know, so it's like in open oh, level yeah. tournaments, you'll see hands are called looser than in a B level tournament and or whatever ranking system you have as far as a, a beginner tournament versus an advanced tournament. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just something that has to be talked about because sets are not called based on spin. Uh, we even had, I think we have uh, Ali creating a rules book for us mm -hmm. and, or a rules quiz for us. And she was texting us or writing, or she wrote us an email saying, I can't find anything online about the spin being the reason for the set, you know? And I'm like, okay, that's maybe that should turn into a true false question. Right. <laughs> so I think that that's where we have to start. I think it's one of the, probably the most fought after calls is when you're a hand setter and you get called for a double and then you turn to the ref and say, why was it a double? And there's a list of things that they'll say, but the rotation rule that's something we've got to get away from no way yeah, yeah. I, a so spin can be but is not necessarily an indicator of a double can be but not necessarily so that means that you can't use it as an argument for why it was a double because if i if i throw a ball right if i like throw a ball underhand like i'm bowling it and it hits a wall it is going to spin out of that, right? It's going to spin off of that one bounce. It didn't hit the wall twice and it's still spinning. So, you know, just by the characteristic of that, you can't say that spin means double, okay? 
can be an indicator. All right. But you need to see the hand contact. So if you're looking at the ball after the set, and that's how you're starting to determine whether it's a double or not, you've, you've already failed as, as a referee, whether you're a player or ref or not. And trust me, guys, we are forgiving to all of the people out there. We know that in your very first volleyball tournament that you ever play in, you're required to referee, which is, is insane, but it's how, it's how our sport is. So everybody can be more forgiving, but maybe this episode can, can just help <laughs> point people in the right direction and at least get them started into doing it in, in a better way. So <laughs> when you're looking for a double contact on a set, what you're looking for is did the ball leave one hand before the other when you're looking at their hands, right? Or did it hit one hand before the other when they set? Either of those is a double contact. Yes, in actuality, like, is everybody contacting the ball at the exact same moment in time? No, but there has to be two clear hits or two clear contacts uh, when you're talking about the setting rule for hands. And um, the key to that, and JM talks about this a lot during our camps, and he's, mm-hmm. he's, a, he's a good rebel. I think he's a good ref. He's never rebel. <laughs> he's good at talking about rebel. Right. Uh, he says that your eyes should be focused on the setter and their hands and not the ball when you're making this play. And the problem is that most people, fans or otherwise, will follow the ball with their eyes naturally. Even when we're doing demonstrations of how your body should look when you hit, people see how high you bounce the ball. And that's like, mm-hmm. okay, this is why we have to get our coaches to stop trying to bounce everything to show off in demos. But it's look at the body. So when you're look, talking about double contact, look at the body. Make sure that it's not um, a double contact. Yeah, and I think one of the th- – a lot of times referees, and especially right now, if we're if we're a pro, if you're a pro ref, I'm not. I'm you do your thing. You know, you've you've studied. I'm not going to take away from your job at all. I think I think a lot of professional referees, you get a you get an earful at a, pretty much every tournament you work. Uh, I know that you're studying the game and you're calling the games the way you think you should. Uh, but when we're when we as players have to ref ourselves, a lot of times is I don't want to implement myself when I'm not needed. You know, I want the players to decide who wins and loses that game. Yeah. So. If you're watching the setter and you can't tell if it went in one hand first or out one hand first, then don't say anything. Don't say, I think it was a double. No. Your answer, it, it needs to say, it looked like it, it went into your right hand before your left, or it looks like it left your left hand before your right. That's that's how you to have that conversation with a player that says, Oh, why, why was that a double? Mm-hmm. But if you say, I, cause I thought so, then that's, that's you implementing yourself into a game that you're not really a part of yeah. and you're changing the score based on your feelings. Mm-hmm. No, it has to be justified. You have to be able to look at that person's hands and be able to say, okay, it touched this hand before that hand. And if you don't know, even if it comes out spinny, you just say, his hands were quick. It looked like it went in both and left at the same time. It was my judgment call to not make a call. Yeah. So I, I think that that's, that's where we have to start off. <laughs> uh, yeah. Good. Calling yeah. doubles. And, yeah. you know, we, we talk about these rules and we say, hey, you got to implement the same rules across the board. Okay? The, the idea that you said where it gets stricter, the lower the level you get, which is insane, but a, a truth in our sport. Uh, why not? Why aren't organizers and leagues and everything like this, why aren't at the A and B levels, so the intermediate or low intermediate levels, why are they still calling doubles? We know that as a sport, it prevents people from even attempting a skill that makes volleyball really cool and really fun. Mm -hmm. But people will play literally for 30 years and say i don't hand set can you, like can you imagine a basketball player for 30 years being like i don't rebound <laughs> just it's not i'm i'm not a dribbler 
but yeah. why? <laughs> Always get called for a double. <laughs> right. Um, you know, it prevents people from progressing mm-hmm. and it prevents whole, completely. It prevents the sport from progressing because when you have people, uh, seniors, adults who kids are looking up to, and this 40 year old adult can't give you any advice on setting other than don't do it. You know, that's like when we talk about like business and, and finance, it's like somebody who attempted to make one business once and failed, just telling the rest of the world, don't start a business, you're going to lose everything. You know, we would never have any advancement. We would never have any programming going forward or, or any progression. And when the adults are telling this to kids, like, well, you don't have to, or, or I don't just because it, it hurt them or they lost some points. The rest of our sport, and if you're talking about like countries or federations, your federation suffers greatly because people aren't picking up this skill that is basically a requirement at the high level now. Yeah, somebody, wow, Mark just left a big old comment. Um, we'll get to him at the end. <laughs> yeah. Um, Thanks, Mark. <laughs> it's uh, something that I like that we do at our camps that especially on on the afternoon of the first day we introduce hand setting we make every single person at our camp focused on hand setting they have to try um it's not a it's not an if they have to do it and then for the rest of camp when we're doing tournaments when we're doing uh live play whatever we're doing we make it very well known that you are not allowed to call somebody else's hands and I think that that's something that's really important. And it's it's great for the growth because even within the four days after we teach hand setting, the amount of progress that we see at a week long camp with people that are hand setting is tremendous. It's unreal. And, it, and it, all we've done is we've eliminated this idea, this phobia, this fear of them losing a point based on something they're trying. Mm-hmm. And I think if, uh, if, if we could treat leagues uh, you know, tournaments, I, I think it's tough, but I do think I'm right there with you where I think there is a certain level where it shouldn't be called. And I, I do see it some places, but there's some places, especially in California, they're very strict. Um, and it, it does slow down the progress a lot. And there are a lot of very, very athletic people out there that mm-hmm. if they just learned how to handset, they could take over the sport. Oh, yeah, but uh, the phobia and the fear. I mean, I was an indoor setter for ten years, and when I first moved to the beach, it took me three years to start hand setting, just <laughs> because I most of the time I was just scared to lose points. You know, mm-hmm. I didn't want to get knocked out of a tournament because of something I was doing. Yeah. But when I first moved to California, I remember I went to a practice with Evie Matthews, and I was hand setting in triangle. And then we got to gameplay and I started bump setting. And he told me that if I ever hand set at one of his practices again, or if I ever bump set at one of his practices again, I wasn't allowed to come back. <laughs> <laughs> and that I like, whenever he said that, I, I, I realized that it was, it was worth more than the calls that I were going to get against me. It was, it was worth kind of going for it. Yeah. And we should and see that everywhere. You know, and, and maybe this is, this is one of those things that like a uh, fortune favors the bold. When you see open level players who are hand setting, maybe those are the ones who were willing to risk losing those points more. Maybe they're more like uh, uh, not risk averse, but they're, they're they're friendly with risk. I forget the, the word for it. Um, but to say that uh, you're okay, willing to lose points early so that you can progress later, you know. So maybe they got mm-hmm. to the open level because. They were willing to take those risks, but it's preventing or it's holding people down when they aren't willing to, to attempt it. Yeah. I think um, we'll, we'll see where that goes, but maybe as a director, maybe you do have different rules for your double A or your advanced and your open level. And you have different, like at least double rules um, for setting when somebody's attempting setting, like think about like spirit of the rule. Maybe that, maybe that should be eased up for the, for the lower rules, but mm-hmm. still, especially because you're having people who have only played volleyball for a month refereeing in those tournaments. So why are you going to require those people to learn how to, how to ref at a higher level than they can even play? Yeah. Couldn't agree more.
Okay, while we're on setting, let's talk about the first and second touch. Can you, Brandon, can you receive the first ball with your open hands? Can you set the first ball? Yes. Yeah. The answer is yes, yeah. unless you're playing in a CBVA. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so CBVA has rules. I, I, I don't, I haven't studied the rule book meticulously, if that's a word, but um, yes, but the, the rule for AVPs, for FIVBs, for most local organizations USA are that volleyball. USA Volleyball is that you are allowed to open hand serve receive, but it's no different than a set. Mm -hmm. It just has to be clean. But Brandon, now, what about a free ball? Same thing. Just oh, wow. has to be clean, you know? Okay. And it, the thing that bothers me with this is that a lot of people will say, oh, they're more strict on if it's the first contact, you know? And, and that's something that we have to get rid of as well is that it, it's not, you can't change the rules based on when the contact is happening, whether it's mm -hmm. the first, second, or third touch. It's, it's the, the thing that you are judging is, is it a double contact? That doesn't okay. change whether it's the first contact or the second contact. So however you're going to judge, we just spent five to seven minutes, whatever, talking about your second hand contact, not judging it on spin, judging it for a specific reason. That is the same exact judging you should use on the first contact or the third contact. The only thing that I will say about the third contact is that if you are purposefully putting the ball over the net, keyword purposely, then you have to be square to where you are facing or to where you are sending the ball. Sorry. So if I'm setting the ball over the net, my shoulders need to be in line with where I am sending that ball. It doesn't matter if I'm backwards. If I'm setting the ball backwards, it still has to be straight over my shoulders, where my shoulders would be. If I had two laser beams pointing out from my shoulders, that ball would have to go into that location. Yeah, in front of you or behind you, just to clarify. In case yeah, 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 in front or behind. You can't like set off your off your shoulder. Or like if you, if you watch indoor volleyball a lot and you see these set, a lot of times we see it in the women's game, where the setter will take the ball. It's not a dump where they're throwing the ball over on the other side of the net with one hand. Sometimes you'll see players that will take it with both hands and they'll just set the ball to their side. Mm -hmm. uh, that is an illegal play in beach volleyball. But as long as you are facing where you're sending the ball over or your back is facing directly where that ball is going to go over it, then it's okay. And before all those people say, see, I told you, hang on, listen to the next part of the rule. Intention is key because if you try to set your partner say it's your second touch you're trying to set your partner but the wind your lack of accuracy uh a, well a seagull would be an interference but <laughs> <laughs> the the wind can take the ball over the net and in that case since you are attempting to set your partner it is legal if it goes over the net, no matter if you're square or not. If you are attempting to set your partner, it's okay to send it over the net. And this is one of those one of those cases in beach volleyball where the referee they have to judge your intent, and usually it's pretty clear. Yeah, you're not going to. Yeah, there should be a blocker waiting right in front of a hitter. And if you're going to send a slow, high ball right at a blocker, you, you kind of deserve to lose that point anyway. They, they, should, they should take advantage of that. But you'll be able to see, and, and everybody gets all fixated on this. Like, well, I could, I could hide my intention. I could just argue that it wasn't. Everybody knows if you're attempting to set somebody. And if you're not, if it, like we say, like the advancement of this rule. Well, okay, let's say that I'm attempting to set my partner, but you have this crazy designed play. Where like you're on the right sideline and your hitter is in the middle of the court and you shoot a ball past them and you try to send it over the net so they fake swing and miss it on purpose like a crazy design trick play uh is that intentionally setting it over or not that 
I don't think that's been really discussed mm -hmm. at, at the high level ref meetings. I would love to sit in and hear that because maybe that's going to become one of those crazy plays uh, that we start to see happening, like a fake swing into a set over. I honestly think it would be super effective. And Especially with the height that some of these today. players are playing at right now. That would definitely be something. But I think a, a really good answer to this, we, we just had a comment from Jacob that says, how do you determine that if you are trying to set tight? You answered it in your question. You are trying to set tight. You mm -hmm. are not trying to set over. Okay, so that you answered the question. If you're yeah. trying to set tight and it happens to go over the net, you were trying to set tight. You weren't trying to set the ball over the net. Answer. <laughs> Answer. Ooh, yeah. yeah. Ooh, yeah. Okay. Uh, and third touch, we already said, if you're sending it over, you, you have to be square up to where you're sending it. So mm -hmm. uh, that should cover everything, except just for the lifts. The number one question that we get for lifts, and it's uh, I posted on my Instagram a little while ago, too. If you want to follow me, at Mark Burick. Burick, not Burick, people. Um, B U R I K. Now, if you are holding the ball, people ask, how long can I hold it before it's a lift? If the ball comes to a visible stop and you can determine that the person has caught it, a slow, long trampoline is pretty different than a catch or a stop. So, yeah, again, this is one of those judgment calls. Did the person catch it? And there's no amount of time. We can't give you, you know, uh, 0.73 seconds. That's just not reasonable. So you just have to say, did the ball come to a stop? Did the person control it and catch it? Or did they just have a long, flowy touch? And uh, you can set from your chest. You can set from your ribs. But it would be unreasonable to say that when the contact started above your head, then you brought the ball all the way down under your ribs. Then you pushed it up you're in contact with that ball for a really long time. So that is probably, well, almost definitely going to be a lift. But if I start my hands like at my nipples, you know, and I just go up forward and I set, just because I caught it below my chin doesn't mean that that's a lift. That's not a lift because I'm still going forward. I'm not in control of the ball. It's when I grab the ball from a certain distance, then I pull it down and then I push it up. And some people, yes, their hands are in contact with the ball for a long time, but are their elbows dropping? That's kind of one of the keys to knowing if it's a catch or like a soft rebound. Um, are my elbows actually dropping in space? Uh, or is it just kind of my forearms that drop? Because the forearms can drop a little bit. They are trying on the world tour to make setting a little bit quicker, a little bit less catchy, but, but there's still some, some room for rebound. So there's no amount of time before you can call a lift. It's just, uh, you just can't hold it and catch it. And different referees might see that in a different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, the first thing that came to mind, and we happened to be talking about this video last uh, on, the, on the drive up to San Francisco, but um, we have a video on YouTube called The Seven Deadly Sins of Hand Setting. And a lot of those sins... Mm -hmm will say, uh, have to do with your ability to break your wrists. And so if you're holding your hands up and they're straight above your head, kind of like you're performing a, a field goal, right? Like someone made a field goal and then you push your hands forward so that they're facing away from your face, then people have this ability to bend their wrist and let their hands fall, like their thumbs almost below, fall below the wrist point. Sorry, I'm trying to explain this for all those listeners out there. Um, if you do not have the ability to do that, then that's when the catch starts to happen a little bit more. Uh, there's one specific portion in our seven deadly sins of hand setting video called stone hands. And I think that this style of setting is where most people who get called on lifts get called for lifting because stone hands what that means is that there's not a break in the wrist you're literally catching that ball your hands don't move at all and then you're just using an elbow bend and extension to make that set uh, a lot of people are really good at doing this without making spin and because a lot of people call doubles based on spin or they call lifts based on spin it doesn't get called a lot so 
uh, I think that that's a really good video for you guys to reference, especially if you have a lot of questions on what's a good handset, what's a bad handset, what are some things that you're probably doing wrong. So uh, if you guys want to look at that video, I think Mark just, no, nope, we can, uh, if you just go on our YouTube channel and search for seven deadly sins of handsetting, Better mm -hmm. Beach, uh, it should be the first one that pops up. And it's it's one of our most, it's one of our favorite videos. It's something that we had a lot of fun shooting. Because we got so. to be goofy. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and if you guys really, really, really want to dive in, we have an at-home setting course. Now, it, we give you drills and responsibilities for 30 days. It, it might not take you that long. Because some of the people in our camps, like you said, by the end of the camp, they're hand setters just because they're trying it and they're doing it for five hours a day, right? Uh, for this course, all it is, it's about 20 minutes of hand sitting drills, specific hand sitting drills and footwork drills every day. And all of the videos are included there. So if you want to check that out, it's better at beach.com forward slash how to set a volleyball. Better at beach.com forward slash how to set a volleyball. If you want to take that as a recorded course, you can take all those drills and all of the written stuff and the reps and sets that you need. They're pre-recorded and we show you how. If you want to dive a lot deeper and have us coach you twice a week so that you can actually post all of your setting videos and then we coach you and make adjustments for you, then you would go to betteratbeach.com forward slash coaching and you would sign up for our coaching membership where it's a one year program for 497, where we get to work with you twice a week, which is a pretty insane deal. So uh, if you want to check those out, betterbeach.com forward slash how to set a volleyball. I would also argue that this might be our best product we have. It's between uh, this and 60A Max Vertical. Yeah, I, I right. That's, those were the two that were coming to mind for me as well. But as far as progression in the sport and seeing a big improvement quickly, I, the videos that I've seen from day one to day 30 in this mm -hmm. course are unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, just getting the practice and the understanding of what you should feel like and look like while you're making this set. Uh, we have one person that comes to our women's classes in Hermosa, uh, and it literally within four weeks of her doing this setting course, she was hand setting Brittany? All, yep, almost oh, yeah. full, almost full time in our practices. Whereas before, she wasn't even thinking about it. And now she is a full-time hand setter with awesome. phenomenal hands. And I don't even think she started taking that class a, a year ago. Yeah. So if you're looking for a quick progression, that's, that's the value is certainly there. Sure. Um, okay. So let's talk about <laughs> do your hands have to be together when you do this overhand contact, right? It mm -hmm. kind of doubles on first balls. So there are a few scenarios that we see this in. Sometimes people will serve receiver, they'll dig a ball and they'll pass it, boom, it'll go off their hands and right into their head. And somebody might call a double. And mm -hmm. they say, well, it hits you different body parts. Or somebody will try to kind of tomahawk, but their hands will be apart. So they'll throw like a double ax handle at it or their two hands will slap the ball. Uh, if it's in one motion, guys, that is legal if it's on the first contact. So if it's your serve receive, if you literally accidentally or on purpose pass a free ball into your own forehead off of your hands, if it happened in one motion, in other words, you didn't pass it and then go and hi -yah, hit it, then it's legal. You're allowed to have a double contact if it's in one continuous athletic motion <laughs> might not look so athletic, but one continuous motion, uh, you're allowed to double contact that. So if your hands are apart, even if it's a slow moving free ball and you don't try to use your finger pads or use a, a setting motion, you don't use finger action, then it is legal so long as there's a little rebound effect there. And that's, again, you guys, it, we have a lot of California people listening. CBVA might have different rules. And if you guys want to, you know, kind of fact check our CBVA rules, go for it. But as far as USA Volleyball uh, and AVP and FIVB, that's perfectly fine. Your hands do not have to be together. Easy? I mean, that should answer it. Like, yeah. It, you know, it's always, it's always tough. I think that that, that answer is perfect. Um, 
Thanks. for just because we're we're an education based podcast company um if a ball is coming out yes you are allowed to take these balls open hand you're allowed the simultaneous contact as long as it's one motion um i i heard you say a couple times and i was when you finished that i was still reading some of the comments on the side got sidetracked uh but i'm seeing a couple comments in here about taking the first ball with open hand receive J just keep in mind like that that does have to be a clean set okay uh there are certain instances where you should put your hands together and make a tomahawk uh if you came and watched mark and i at practice if we get a free ball to us not a whole lot are we taking that ball as a set mm -hmm. uh we're 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 performing a tomahawk a pokey uh because those are touches that you 100 percent know are never going to be called. Um, so I just wanted to kind of hop back on and say, be, while you do need to know the rules, you also need to understand when you should be performing these specific contacts. Uh, so, um, and that's that's kind of one of them, especially when we're thinking about overhand contacts with within serve receive or easy free balls. And, and we got one of those caveat questions from Vibranium Steelix uh, on YouTube. And he said, wait a second, I thought you just said that the handset has to be clean if it's on the first contact. Mm -hmm. If you're using finger action, so yeah. like if you're waving to somebody or you know, squeezing your palms or doing spirit fingers or setting, if you're using finger action, then it's got to be clean. It's got to be a clean set. But if you're not using finger action, so your fingers stay stiff and rigid. Um, like, and Im imagine ball. both of your hands become ping pong paddles. Oh, nice. I like that. I think I yeah. heard one of our coaches say that last week. Yeah. Then that's fine because you're not utilizing your finger action. So then it then the setting rules don't apply on that first touch. Okay. If we go to the second touch though, and you set a ball into your forehead, like you bump set it and it ricochets off your hands and then your head, then it is a double. Okay. Same mm -hmm. thing for attacking. Right? If you like spike the ball off of your own head somehow and, and make it go in, or you spike the ball off of your other hand, which would be a cool move for a, for a highlight channel, it's not legal in volleyball. But the first ball over, so receives, free balls, attacks, you're allowed to double contact it no matter what if you're not using finger action, right? And, um, and it's one motion. I like it. It looks good. Um, getting called out here. This is a it's a great episode. Um, where are I, I? These comments that you guys are sending and the answers are great and I love it. Uh, volleyball highlights. I just saw you guys ex say this. Explain eleven. Does a blocking contact count as one of the three illegal contacts? Your answer no. I don't know when at any point during this episode we said that that does not count as a contact. He might be uh, taking um, our quiz and if we oh, have a quiz, um, okay. Gotcha. I'll, Number I'll 11. Check that. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. So uh, volleyball highlights. I will clear that up right now. The, if the block touches the ball, they, and this is, this is a good rule for us to talk about because I think a lot of people, especially coming from indoor, mm -hmm. they, in indoor volleyball, when the block touches the ball, so the hitter hits the ball off the blocker, then they still have three touches to make that play, to get the ball back over the net. And beach volleyball, that has changed, where the first touch off of the block does count towards your three contacts. But there are some interesting points to that, because if the blocker is above the height of the net and they are making a blocking play, then they are allowed to also touch that second ball which means that the, their partner would be responsible for the third contact going over the net. Okay, so uh, volleyball highlights, if that was something that uh, we had on, on our quiz, thank you for finding that. I appreciate you kind of filling us in. Um, our, uh, yeah, our, the, he was answering it probably from an indoor perspective. And our volleyball rules quiz is specifically for beach volleyball, just so you guys yeah. know. Yeah, so it's only beach volleyball. So when whenever we're talking about it, the blocking touch in beach volleyball does count as the first contact. So the contact after that would be considered the set. And then finally, 
uh, the your partner or depending on how that that touch order went, uh, you would only have two more touches after the block touch to get that ball onto the other side of the court. Cool. And we got a we got an answer from our good friend uh, Joe Lambert who's talking about blocking distance. So let's get to that right after one of the other common ones. Okay. okay. Uh, the common one is our open hand slap. When some people dig the ball underhand mm -hmm. with an open hand, is this legal? Because there are a lot of leagues, a lot of even high level tournaments that I've heard internationally where when you hit this ball, when you pop it from underneath, it's called a lift. And if 100% is not, if the ball has a bounce or rebound effect, if the ball stops in your hands and then you guide it up, that is different than you hitting it. Because imagine you're using the exact same contact if you just flip your hand over and you spike it. That's, it's just an underhand spike. So I think a lot of people confuse this and they confuse it because of like this, uh, as if you're saying like, give me money to somebody or saying come here, right? Uh, using that finger action where that ball rolls off or you're trying to use finger action, then it gets lifty. Then, then you can call that as illegal. But if you pop a ball with your open hand, whether it's over your head, outside of your body, or from underneath, like when you're diving and digging a cut shot, that is legal so long as there is a rebound effect. And people, everybody, everybody, stop calling that unless you see them throw it up or make that kind of a give me money or come here action with their fingers. Mm -hmm. I, I related a lot to like a layup in basketball, how it kind of start the ball starts at your palm and then it r rolls off of your fingers. So it's mm -hmm. like a, a fingertip layup mm -hmm. uh, or a roll. I don't even know what I act like. I know what I'm talking okay. about when I'm talking about yeah. basketball, but um, roll. yeah, finger roll. There you go. Yeah. So whenever somebody's doing that kind of layup, that that's what that would be a lift. Yeah. But if it's just we're going back to those ping pong paddles and you're just slapping up that ball and there's mm -hmm. a big pop and the rebound is there and it's quick, doesn't sit in your hand or roll on your hand at any point, completely good. Guys, if you're still listening and you're interested just before you go or you're midway through the episode, uh, we, we developed two rules quiz and we really, we really want your feedback on them. We would love for you to take them. Uh, we used language that volleyball players would use. So it's not very hardcore technical language that referees and judges would use. We taught, we told and asked, sorry, we asked the questions to the quiz as if you were just two guys, two girls talking and hanging out on a beach and, and discussing the rules. So if you want to check out all those questions, we got one question that's uh, one quiz that's about 15 questions. And I think the other might be uh, 20 to 25 questions. If you go to betteratbeach.com forward slash rules, quiz rules quiz uh you'll be able to find just two quick quizzes and uh you get your answers graded and sent to you in an email and then it also puts you as part of our email list where you'll get all of our announcements for camps clinics swag sales and of course we send everybody free lessons in your inbox every week so at the end of that quiz you just make sure you click on that subscribe to marketing emails. There's no way to change that because not all of our emails are marketing. In fact, 95% of our emails are just education based. So um, you guys go ahead and betterbeach.com forward slash rules quiz. You can take uh, about 45 questions of commonly discussed rules arguments so that uh, you're prepared to ref or <laughs> argue with refs at your next term. <laughs> Just don't be mean. Don't be the yeah. bully. I was that when I was coming up, and I still get a little aggressive. But it's on. It's on my uh, New Year's resolutions. Yeah, we all have our arguing styles. <laughs> yeah, so. for sure. Um, okay. Uh, I do. We want to kind of move back to blocking because there's a couple of other. I we we've already talked on touched on the uh, the first contact being a touch. Um, we, we we can't let Joe's question go unanswered. I mean, he's, he's right. throwing a clinic for us in Salt Lake City. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, let's rock on that right away before okay. uh, you go. Well, I want, I want to go back to blocking. There's just a couple of other ones that I want to talk about as well. Cool. Yeah. All right. So blocking, is there a distance from the net where a block touch is no longer a block? According to the rule book, there is not. The only distance that the rule book says is near near the net 
So it leaves it very much up to interpretation. And a blocking action is attempting to stop a ball coming into your playing zone. It's preventing a ball from coming into your playing zone. So some people, like you'll see Ricardo does this a lot. Avery Drost, Drost used to do it a lot. Um, Brandy Wilkerson on the women's side, we've seen her block balls from nearly like half court, which is getting pretty borderline. But according <clears> to the rules, <throat> is that near? Eh, now it's up to the ref. Uh, so you can step away from the net, jump, and try to swat at a ball, and it will be counted as a block. It needs to look like a blocking action, so you can't like jump and set it, or you can't like kind of take it back behind your head, do a 360 windmill dunk, or anything like that. You still need to be actively trying to like throw it back into their court. But there's there's no specific distance. And one of the other funny rules that we get is like when you do step off like that, sometimes you go, you step off the net, and you try to reach real high to swat a block, and then somebody will spike down, right? And they'll hit like maybe your stomach or something. Mm -hmm. Uh, that actually counts as a block touch, meaning you can then play it again if the ball hits you. So if any part of your body, any part of your body is above the net during a blocking action and you get hit in any part of your body, it's a block contact, meaning you can then play it. So if I, if I somehow like jump to block and I'm maybe three or four feet away from the guy and he hits it so steep that it hits my foot, that's a block touch, which it's kind of one of those hmm. rare rules that doesn't happen frequently at all. But if some part of my body, any part of my body is above the plane of the net and I'm somehow trying to prevent the ball from coming over here, uh, then it's a block touch and I can play that second ball. It's rare, but it's a, it's a fun one to know. And it, it happened in, a, I think, a German, uh, one of the German tours. They threw it on there. Instagram and everybody was raging in the comments. Ah, I remember. Was that when uh, w one of the tournaments that like Walking Horse was yeah. uh, commentating on? I can't I, wait to get Walking Horse on here. Yeah, and he's, he's so much fun to talk with. Yeah, about. he's hilarious. Uh, he did a great job with that. Um, and so I, another uh, blocking rule while we were talking about the first contact being the first touch of the play. The only time that that doesn't happen is if it's a joust. And what a joust is, is when, <clears throat> let's say Mark is on the other side of the net, I'm blocking Mark when he's hitting. Sometimes the sets drift tight and it gets to a point where we can touch the ball at the same time. Whenever we, whenever there's a simultaneous contact with the attacker and the blocker, that is called a joust. And it doesn't take away a touch from the blocking side. Mm -hmm. So if there is a joust and Mark pushes the ball onto my side of the court and he wins the joust, then my team would still have three touches. So I could pass that ball up in the air. My partner could set me and then I could attack, but it has to be a joust or the contact has to be at the same time with the attacker and the blocker. Um, and there, for those of you out there, that a lot of people, myself included, will intentionally lose jousts mm -hmm. in order to give themselves a free ball. I remember playing Phil on center court, and he's massive, right? And I'm like, I'm going up and do joust on a tight ball, and I like, I start pushing it, and I feel his hands wrap around the ball, and as I push away, he actually tosses the ball back to Nick, you know, like. <laughs> And he kind of threw his hands, you know, and he said that like he lost the joust, but somehow it ended up in this perfect lofty free ball back to Nick. And he did it so deftly that I was just like, yeah. like in that moment before I landed, I was like, did he just take that and toss it back to Nick? <laughs> <laughs> and it, of course, he didn't get called for it. But when he did that, I was like, this, this is just another level. When somebody has that sense to joust and yeah, he loses, but actually because he's up so high and he's got so much control that he wraps his hand around the ball then he gives it back to his partner and they get three more touches. I was like, damn, that's just six, nine, 40 inch vertical unfair. <laughs> and just seeing the game in slow motion. That's, that's impressive. Like that, mm -hmm. that is a situation where the game has slowed down for you so much that you can think of doing that in a point. 
uh, that's, that's incredible. Uh, we got a question saying our t-shirts rock. Uh, we went over that already, guys. At the beginning of the podcast, we said go to betteratbeach.com forward slash shop and you can get the t-shirts and the hats. Oh, not the hats, but some teacups and some uh, fanny packs and everything. We got a few cool designs. Up some there. pillows. Do we have pillows on there still? Yeah, maybe. It's my favorite. Got a couple. <laughs> got a You're couple at home. Great, great decor. <laughs> um, we have any time for any last commonly argued rules i think what what needs to be discussed is coming under the net Mm -hmm. the under the net rule guys there is contact there's always contact under the net and every single player thinks that it wasn't them you came under it couldn't have been me that's everybody's like default argument you came under and there is the referees here are trained, uh, USA Volleyball, FIVB, ABP. They're trained to say, was this a significant safety issue? And then players say, well, yeah, yeah, I felt unsafe. Everybody's got their borderline of like what they consider safe. You know, you could feel me dust the hairs on your leg and be like, dude, you got, I've got bad knees. You're going to snap my knees in half, you know, and, and they'll try to call it on you. There is so much contact under the net in beach volleyball there's a lot but it's does it prevent first of all is it a huge safety issue where somebody's like it's it was reckless of the player to go for that ball um and their body is flying recklessly and does that interfere with or stop the person from making their next play on the ball sometimes there's a loose rule here where it might interfere but it doesn't necessarily stop them because you could argue, hey, he touched me and that freaked me out. So I wasn't ready to make the next play on the ball. And yeah, maybe that should be a rule, but there's no line that we have like in indoor. So mm-hmm. you're allowed to come under. It's just already coming under in a way that's that's so unsafe. And does it, do you contact that player so that they're physically unable to make their next play on the ball? Or you've deterred them in such a way that it, it's significantly harder. That's when the call is made. But if you just nudge each other under the net, stop crying and, and play on, right? And then just say like, hey, let's both be careful. And if you really are concerned for your knees and your safety and you like you don't jump because you see someone flying, flying at me, great. Okay, lose the point, but keep your knees. I wouldn't <laughs> do that. Yeah. You know, back away from the net when you start seeing that happen and then, be like, and then have a talk with them and have a talk with the ref and be like, this guy's out of control. Uh, and, and we can't, we can't play like this, mm-hmm. but, uh, at some, at some point volleyball players almost have to like take the charge to get that call. And most people are focused on winning the play instead of taking that charge. And so it, more often than not, this play is not called at the highest level. If it becomes a crazy safety issue again, where people are flying under the net and spearing you and drop kicking you in the shins. Uh, then you need to talk to the ref, tournament director, and, and they should be called on that. But if you're both going for the ball, you're already near the net, and you just kind of like cross toes or somebody lands on somebody's foot, yeah, that's going to happen. That's par for the course. Keep playing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I used to get a little offended by this, you know, because – when I was, I, I used to think like, oh my gosh, this attacker doesn't care about me at all, you know? But I had a change of thought. Actually, it's been quite recent where, you know, it's it's more of just a drive for that person to try to keep the ball in play and win the point, you know? Mm-hmm. So sometimes people do, their, their feet come under the net a little bit too much. They're, especially in a competitive environment. If you're at practice, be safe. Don't don't be that person that jumps and lands under the net. It's like one of my biggest pet peeves. Uh, mm-hmm. But if you're in a tournament, just realize that the other team's competing just as hard as you are. And that conversation can happen. You can say, hey, ref, I, I'm feeling very unsafe when this person's jumping and landing and, and putting me in harm. And then once you say that, that player hears that, I guarantee you that things start happening differently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you'll start to win some points that you should. But no, don't make it one of those 
every single time right. arguments and a big deal, a big blow up where everybody's like, now you're arguing instead of practicing or playing volleyball. You know, there's going to be contact under the net. Somebody's going to step on somebody's toes. Somebody's going to rub shins. Mm-hmm. Just go and get the ball. You know, I think, I think volleyball players can stop being old babies about it. <laughs> you know, we right. both come from football. Like you played in, in high school. I got, I got a game yeah. in college. It's just like, all right, so somebody clip my legs. Like, yeah. Oh, man. I was about as baby as they come in football, though. <laughs> God, did I get hit a lot. I hated it. <laughs> it was rough. Um, I think, you know, we might be able to cover some more because we do get a lot of questions. Guys, if you do have questions, more of these. We have a great, great, great Facebook group. Uh, it's called Volley Chat. Get better at beach volleyball. Or if you want the URL, it's betterbeach.com forward slash groups forward slash better at beach. And we have a number of literally world class referees who are in there tirelessly answering the same questions over and over and over again. So mm-hmm. if you do have a question, scroll through, search that Facebook group, Volley Jacket Better Beach Volleyball. Search that Facebook group in the search bar and like just search rule and you'll see all of the posts that have all of the rules popped up. Um, we got Darren Grimsey in there. Uh, we got uh, Dave Vandermeer, Susan Lowry. Um, I'm, I'm probably missing uh, Sooty from, from New Zealand. These are all world tour referees and directors of referee education and ABP refs. And they're answering all those questions. So if you guys do have questions, and we'll, we'll do a part two on this, but if you do have questions, mm-hmm. for that Facebook group, hang out with us because a lot of people also discuss like technique and strategy and kind of ongoing in that Facebook group. So if you have a question, go there, don't ask it right away, search for it first. And then if you don't find your answer, you can go there. And if you want to take this quiz, because uh, we made it for you, we spent a few days building this quiz to, to test you and, and, and see if you guys like that way of doing things. Uh, it's better at beach.com forward slash rules quiz. Easy. I like it. All right. And, I think uh, I, th- I think we could have a 24 hour episode on rules yeah. questions based on comments. <laughs> just because people just ask every like miniature version of yeah, the question. I love it. Uh, guys, if you're interested in ever coming to a clinic or hosting us for a clinic, we just went up to San Francisco. We had 69 players just based on one like organization slash group of friends. You don't need a club. You need at least 12 players. If you got 12 players, we can send you one of us or one of our coaches to train you for a full day, seven and a half hours. Uh, you get shirts, you get wristbands, you get lanyards, and we cover a lot of volleyball. So if you have a group of friends, 12 people, and a beach volleyball court that you can control um, or that you have permits for, then we can be there. If you have a facility, we can come to your facility. Uh, if you have a club, we would love to come and start working with some clubs. But we have upcoming clinics that you can sign up for coming up in Salt Lake City, uh, Ozark, Ozark, Missouri, I believe, uh, Huntsville, Alabama, Long Island, Grand Sands in Ohio, which is Loveland, Ohio, outside of Cincinnati. Uh, we have a private event coming up in Santa Monica. But uh, all of these can be found at betterbeach.com forward slash clinics. And if you do want to bring us out, you go to betterbeach.com forward slash clinics, fill out one of those forms, and we'll get in touch and we'll see what we can do. And maybe we can uh, hang out for a weekend. Love it. They're fun. They are fun. All right. All right. Um, we'll list the resources in the show notes as they're coming up. Make sure that you subscribe to us on YouTube podcast, uh, Apple podcast, Google podcast, Spotify, uh, and come and join our email list. And you can find a number of resources, free resources at betterbeach.com. So hope you guys enjoyed the show. We are going to start with our audience Q and a, we might have five to 10 minutes and then we go back. yeah, uh, those of you who are heading out before the Q and a, thanks for everything. And Brandon, we'll see you on the sand. <laughs> I like it. I want it. Nice. That's our that's our new sign off phrase for you guys. Uh, yeah, we're trying mainly to mainly because we uh, 
after we're done with these podcasts, Mark and I go to the beach and we've been saying, all right, I'll see you on the sand. And it <laughs> just makes sense. So it's going to be something. I'm turning it in. Right. All right. So all right. Q&A. Questions. Jacob, are we are y'all related? No. Kind Could of. Could be. Maybe. We'll see. Should be. <laughs> <laughs> no, not related. Just, uh, just best pals that have yeah. known each other for over 15 years. Oh. Um, yeah. It's pretty cool. So, all right, Mark. This the is most such challenging a long... to play that is controversial for high school beach is the open hand serve receive or open hand first touch. The defense rule is the first team contact with finger action should be judged as any setting contact. The referee should call a double hit if the player uses a finger action and the ball is clearly doubled. Exception. If the ball contact was in defense of a hard driven attack, then the referee should allow play to continue. Hard driven is judged by the speed and trajectory. The referee must judge the player's action. Reactive double is allowed or intentional. In other words, um, that I had time to choose which, uh, which skill I was going to use. Then you can call a double contact. The question is, is this rule clear enough for you for the defense? Our league is trying to switch to allow serve-receive setting. Is it legal to serve-receive? <laughs> um, long, long, long question. The other part here is, what does strict mean? How do we draw the line for high school level or beginners? You draw the line by letting them play. <clears throat> if it looks athletic, <clears throat> let them play. And start uninvolving the refs or de-involving the referees so that there's less pressure on a 14-year-old girl to, to to blow her whistle, right? And just keep playing. You know, if it's like medium, if it's maybe kind of arc, maybe a little bit soft, put the whistle away and play ball. We would rather see a bump set spike play than the play get killed by a referee who is trying to blow that whistle. So if you're going to default somewhere, default and letting them play more. Yeah, and the only thing, Mark, the only thing that I don't like about the wording of all this is the word strict. But strict hand setting judgment must be applied to the contact. No, it's just but hand, uh, but hand setting judgment must be applied to the contact. That's it. When we use that word strict, that strict is a very, uh, it's a fearful word, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to be very strict about this assignment. Um, that's something you're like, oh man, like I need to try a little bit harder on this. No, it's still a handset. I think if we just get rid of that word strict, it makes everything a lot less tense. Okay. All you right. You want to learn how to handset? Fairbeach.com forward slash how to set a volleyball. How to set a volleyball. Easy. Sorry for the long comment, but I felt compelled. <laughs> I like it, Mark. I appreciate your apology. <laughs> uh thank you i got called on double so many times when i started playing i had said this cool there you go jeff i guess necessary evil why does a sport that have pretty established history have rule changes so often hand setting used to really be a skill now we are opening it up to everyone to just chuck the ball i disagree for basketball i guess my answer is how many three-pointers did did shaq shoot Maybe if maybe Nathan, if you, you gotta realize that the rules change in every sport, yeah, every year. Uh, look at uh, the extra point in in football. That changed by what 10, 10 yards, um, just mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. Uh, there are there are constant rule adjustments that are attempting to make it a slightly easier to ref, and most importantly, I think what they pay attention to is the fan engagement is are, are the fans able to enjoy this and when we have these uh, super tight hand setting rules fans get really confused and like when my wife who's been watching me play for seven years goes what happened after a whistle blows that's a problem she's been watching me play for seven years you know so uh, something has to something has to change that doesn't confuse those people and the, the, to, to answer your question like as, as far as an established history every sport is constantly evolving with their rules that they have to implement every single 
sport. Um, so just take that as a, you know, for what it is and that people are trying to make the, the sport more engaging, better for fans. And they recognize that once players know the rules, they get really good at them. Mm-hmm. And then there might become some ways to, once, once the base of a skill is now at a higher level, all of a sudden now we have to maybe change it. So. Yeah. I, I would say mo- most rules that have been changed, there's always one, one change per cycle of rule mm-hmm. changes that kind of causes a little bit of controversy. But I would say most of them are mm-hmm. in line with where the sport needs to be heading. You know, and, and the one thing about federations when they make these rule changes is that if it doesn't work, they just go back. I remember a couple of years ago, they were they were debating making the rule change from um, the first touch in a block not counting. Yeah. I remember we did a whole off season where all of a sudden now the block touch didn't count as a touch. And it was it really threw a lot of people off and it was kind of interesting. And then now we're back to that new rule or to the old to the old style. But I, I think it's it's a really good idea to kind of look at things. Athletes are evolving daily. People are getting more athletic. You're, you're able to do things. You're able to play longer. Um, so the rules have to kind of be looked at as well. Mm-hmm. You need to take clips out of these and make a separate channel to post. Uh, I think we will. Huh. So Jacob, yeah, that's, that's, a, a, that's an interesting point. I like that. We do uh, what's called nuggets. So after this, our editors go in and they dive into each individual kind of chapter within our hours. And then they post them individually on Facebook as well as our Instagram. If you're ever on our Instagram, uh, mine is Mark Burrick and Brandon, yours is? Joy underscore Beach VB. And we have Better at Beach Volleyball as an Instagram. If you look at those, all you gotta do is save and share any posts that we have about rules. Go ahead and cycle through our reels. Mm -hmm and you will see a lot of these questions answered in tiny one minute nuggets. Yeah. Um, but also on YouTube, we're gonna be uploading larger segments, which are, we call them like knowledge nuggets. So we'll break this episode into like four to eight minute answers um, and then break them down. But there's a there might be a one month lag from the filming and, of this into- I And we cool. already have a decent amount of YouTube videos explaining, especially hand setting rules. Uh, I know for sure you've done one on that. Um, I believe the digging contacts, uh, you've already done one on those as well. So mm-hmm. if you search our YouTube about rules, uh, that you'll be able to find those there as well. If you're looking for examples, I think Tanya does a good job of putting in some B-roll of players tr- uh, doing the correct style uh, of play based on the rule. Um, let's let's get to Vibranium Steelix. Uh, his question, why are sets called differently indoors than outdoors? More emphasis on calling doubles and less lifts. Personally, I think it, due to the evolution of the indoor game moving faster than the mm-hmm. beach game, I think they realize that they, they want to see just more athletic, fast, hard hitting things. And the more that they blow the whistle and confuse the fans, the worse it is for the sport. So I think that's why they've allowed a lot of spins um, with volleyball. They recognize that it's a high powered game and they're going to move fast. So mm-hmm. beach is coming. It's it's definitely on the way that, that indoor was where now we're running spread sets and options and combo offenses, but it's not fun to watch whistles, to see whistles get blown. It's really mm-hmm. I also think an indoor setting settings easier. It's, it's not a, uh, you're not having to deal with elements. You're not having to deal with wind. You're not having to deal with sand where you're uneven whenever you're moving. Most of the time, if you're a good athletic setter, then you are putting yourself into a position where your body can always do a pretty decent set. Uh, but I, th- I think in indoor, they might have gotten rid of double calls it seems recent, like it. recently. No, I think like I'm I'm not 100% sure. Don't quote me on it. But I think like moving that was one of the big rule changes moving forward. Hmm. I think uh, I'll look at I'll look it up. But um, it, and a lot of it, it has to do with what Mark <laughs> said is it's it's more about the speed and indoor is just so fast that these sets are coming out with some spin. 
but most of the time it still looks like it's a simultaneous contact with hands. It just, they're not cradling this ball as much as beach setters have to because of the elements and just the style of the sport. Disadvantageous to do that because once you slow the the ball down, the blockers can get an easier read on you Mm -hmm. uh, for indoor and yeah. It, everybody knows who you're setting in beach. <laughs> right. Yeah, true. Okay. Uh, Ernesto picked up beach volleyball since moving to Santa Monica. Played soccer my whole life, but I've enjoyed the sport so much. Your videos have been helping me out with the rules and tips. Thank you. Ernesto, thank you for tuning yeah. in and watching. Thanks. Appreciate you, man. All right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What are the best stretches to prevent injuries, Ernesto? So, um, Number one, if you want to look, go through a full mobility program, you sign up for our foundations program. It's a seven-day mobility program that is focused on injury prevention and developing your face. Go to betteratbeach.com forward slash foundations. That will give you seven days of glute activation, shoulder health series, um, a few bonuses included, and mobility session every single day so betterbeach.com forward slash foundations that will give you all of your answers for the best stretches to prevent injuries um i'm moving up to david cook Uh, all the tournaments i've played have used the spin rule and no sets on serve receive what should i do in these say no you're wrong or just go with it uh while we have our opinions on what rules should be established we are using like the usa volleyball rules and and the tournament and tours that we currently play on that are at the top level in the u.s and we hope that organizations across the u.s and smaller cities localities wherever you are are using those same rules but at the end of the day it is the it's the option of the organizer to create their own rules. If they want to say that we're going to judge sets by spin, then unfortunately that's something you have to deal with. I think it's something you can bring up with them. If it's something, if they have their own established rule book with these rules written in it, then obviously you have to follow those rules. Don't, don't (laughs) say, Oh, but better at beach said this. Um, I think it's it's a good conversation to have with the organizer and say, what do we think about evolving these rules to, mm. to match the organizations that are at the top in the U.S.? Um, but some, some, I know like the CVA, they have very strong feelings and ties to the older, the way that the game used to be played. So they have kept those rules around. I know Pottstown Rumble still uses side out rules. They still but use they say- a court old school rules. yeah but it says old school they're, so they're proud of it so okay yeah go with that you know yeah so de- definitely if you're if you're in if you're playing in a local tournament somewhere make sure you look at their rule book first uh see what their what laws and calls they're going to be making and i, I would encourage every tournament director league coordinator out there if you don't have your rule book set mm-hmm. go with the rule book that you want which is, it could be USA Volleyball. If you want to use CBBA, it's okay. Uh, ABP, FIVB, and say, here are the rules. And you should include that. I mean, it's so easy to include a downloadable PDF in every in every email. Just mm-hmm. set that as automatically to go out for your tournament announcement or, or um, tournament information emails so that everyone always has access. And th- I think that'll make everybody's lives a little bit easier. But if you're a tournament organizer or director and you don't at least have a link to the rules somewhere on your website or a PDF included somehow uh, in those emails, why not help the players out with them, read, educate them? I like it. Um, We already answered Joe's one. We already answered volleyball highlights. Uh, Vibranium got another one. Uh, One more quick question about finger action having to be clean. If you one hand set it and it isn't clean, is that legal? That's Uh, a throw. Yeah, if there's finger action and it's a setting contact and you're kind of a lot of indoor setters do this with like a one-handed set, that's that's not going to be allowed on the sand. It doesn't necessarily make sense according to all of the other rules. But that's how it's called. It's called as a throw or a lift. If you're using, yeah. uh, one hand. I would, if you are put into that position, I would 
go back to that ping pong paddle, slap it, or you can poke it. Uh, the famous Hudson Bates one hand pokey sets will always live in my memory. <laughs> oh, Mark Zen is sending uh, our rules quizzes to all their players. That's cool. I like uh, that. That's, that's awesome. why we built it. Yep. Share it. Eric Falk, who's going to be at our Salt Lake City Clinic. I can't wait to see Eric. Uh, intent to set rule written with the help of oversets due to wind. Probably. It might have it, it been with help of wind, but it's just spirit of the game. You don't want to call the whistle. You want to let people play it out and let the players finish it instead of the referees finish it or rule technicalities finish it. Ooh. What about playing a ball that is passed out of bounds on the other side of the net? Can I go under and play it and bring it back? So take uh, our rules quiz and you'll get the answer to that because me and Brandon have to go practice. Yeah. Oh shoot. What time is it? One oh yeah, two. we do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That is out there. That is a really fun one. Um, and it's on our rules quiz yeah. specifically. So betterbeach.com forward slash rules quiz. If you have any other questions or if you guys think that we should add some questions to those quizzes, definitely send them. Mm -hmm. And we'll yeah. legitimately add them, and we'll be thankful to you. Yeah. So, guys, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to head out. We're going to get Sandy. And uh, get in touch. DM us if you have any questions about our courses, clinics, camps, whatever. We're happy to hear. You can always email support at betteratbeach.com, and our team will get right back to you. Yeah. Thanks for all the questions and comments today, guys. That was fun. Appreciate you yeah. all. Super engaged. All See right. you on the sand. See you on the sand.